Hey, everyone, welcome. This is the weekly briefing, the once a week a time where we just pull ourselves away from the routines and the work that we're doing, ask bigger industry questions. A lot of the stuff and information that we get comes from clients that we have or the community um, that we're all part of, um, asking and hearing questions. Um, and honestly, like in this one specifically, I've been asked directly from a couple of people to like, I'll just say solve this problem. Um, there are areas like gaps in our pipeline or, or margins that we used to have in our companies have disappeared. And people are asking me like, where do I pivot to? Where's the, where's the new profit margin? So luckily someone asked me that question um, about three weeks ago. Perfect timing when I got the quarterly reports uh, for Q2 done and we can analyze it. I have a, one more report I'd love to show next week if people don't think I'm too geeky and just showing too many industry metrics. I want to show uh, one more where I've uh, broken down industry in different uh, categories. But it wasn't ready for prime time today. I try to get it there, but uh, too much analysis to be done. But these three items kind of came out of that where these companies are winning. Um, and I wanted to be able to share that specifically of like where I know the wins are with the companies I'm working with and get some more other theories out there of like why that might be happening and what changes or pivots are taking place in our industry that are requiring us to behave differently or see things differently in order to make better choices. Yep. Okay, well, Tim, I'm gonna hold you up on the first one. And you know what I'm hearing and what you've been hearing is everyone wants more for less or more for the same amount. And uh, you know things are tight, people want the world, but how, uh, how do you price around this? What's the, what's the secret around pricing strategy? Oh yeah, so, so okay, so no, no matter what, we're all hearing the same thing, right? People want the same for less or more for fewer dollars. Um, that crunch has been having us behave in in a very different way, especially with the advance of technology and the question of like, can we find more efficiencies in our pipeline? I'm going to use a bad word, AI, right? We're asking, asking ourselves a question, are there any ways of automating something, looking at AI or processing it? But in the reality, when it comes to pricing strategy, there's something actually very different happening. One thing is, is that most of us are hearing that there isn't any more money. So we have to do the same amount of work for fewer dollars or more work for the same dollars. Um, but there are actually some people that are getting higher prices than they used to. Um, but here's the trick, or here's the one, like if I analyze the ones that are gaining it, it's actually in the production pipeline that they're gaining more revenue instead of where we usually depend on it is in the creative pipeline. And what I mean by that is like, we're creative companies. So we think the way to win a project is to pitch, have beautiful stuff, pretty pictures, get the client convinced and really excited about the project, make it look really expensive and then make a bid that matches. And I think there's a behavior pattern happening with our clients and they're kind of seeing as like, well, I, I know it looks great, but still only a few days, right? And so we've always chased this like value-based versus commodity-based pricing. And we're pushing back, hey, it's not about how many days, it's the, the item we're delivering. But we have this conversation in the often in the wrong place. We're trying to convince them that the photos, I'm sorry, not photos, but the images we're producing, the, the final deliverables is where the value is going to be. And this specific case, or, or right now, I feel like things have shifted. And it's actually your producers should be the front end of this conversation, not your creative team. And the the seasoned producers are the ones that, you know, they don't like um, guard the barriers very much. They're not the naysayers. The seasoned producers are the ones that make you feel like they're partnering with you. Um, and this partnership conversation is a, creates a different approach to pricing because your production team can actually share something of like the method you're about ready to engage in or the effort you're going to put into getting a project done and, and sharing that with a client that the client understands and then gives more money for that project. So that that commodity-based thing as another layer of complexity and be able to, in very easy terms, share the complexity of the project so that converting mm -hmm. complexity to simple is where people are winning. Without using that dirty word of education. Yeah, like education's kind of funny because it almost has like a derogatory term. And, and I think what it's become something of like, there's a lot of, We'll just say like in the agency space, there's a lot of agency producers that are actually not educated. They don't have enough experience. They're not ready 
to to understand all that you're trying to accomplish as a vendor of theirs. So we we take the time to educate them, but we actually kind of distance ourselves from them in that kind of conversation. And this one, it's different. It's like um, uh, I'll use I'll use a soccer term or like soccer thinking. It's it's like taking your defensive players and moving them up to midfield and turning into the offense, where we often depend on our producers to be the barrier keepers. Hey, don't let them cross over the the schedule or don't let them cross over that budget. Fight when they get close to that line. When we have small margins, we almost are fighting twice as much, right? It's it's more intense. And if I can take that defense and move it to offense and be able to programmatically from the beginning work with the client through the process, the client will drop the barrier and saying, oh, no, I actually realized that this does cost more. I can go get you more money. And in one case, um, in the uh, small group conversation we're having, uh, the, their client went to other departments to find more money to bring into the project because they needed the mm. project done and the better producer was able to understand that, share that with the client and the client, of course, that makes sense. They went and got more money. So it's the wins are happening in production, I guess is what I'm saying. The, the pricing strategy yeah. is actually working alongside that client with their limits, letting producer talk to producer and work their way through what the problem is instead of convincing them that this is this is all about the design or you know it's it's four minutes. Four minutes cost more than two minutes. That that kind of conversation is uh, where we're still going to struggle with this small margin, high commodity marketplace that we're in right now. Yeah, no, and the, and the always uh, highly contributive Ryan Summers um, has just pointed out that it feels like there's a, a different role for a producer here, um, a hybrid producer or a lead creative and creative development, and that a lot of producers aren't perhaps capable of leading the conversation that we're talking about. Uh, Ryan, I totally agree with you. I think um, some of what I'm seeing is almost like the industry had fil has filtered producers, right? It's been a um, a difficult marketplace. So we'll say the producers that some agencies kept or some studios kept and others they let go of. So we're kind of getting the cream of the crop moving up through the ranks just because of that needing to cut people back and you're going to keep the, the better of the of the selection there. In that case, then we're getting a more seasoned producer talking to a more seasoned producer. And I think that's the evolution we're seeing taking place. What I see is instead of trying to educate your client, you might want to actually educate your future producers. So if this becomes a long, mm. from a short-term strategy, not just a Q3 strategy, but a 2025 strategy, you'd say maybe my best investment is finding current producers or future producers that are willing to listen. That's a, a, a big qualifier there that are willing to understand something new and willing to under engage the client, not with an adversarial role, but a partnership role. Um, and I think there's like a seasonality to the industry that's allowing that to take place now, where before, you know, it's basically swapping budgets and letting the creative and um, do all the talking. Excellent. And now before we talked about producers, you're just about to leap into talking about the, the evil twin of pricing strategy, which is sales methods. So what, what are, what are people doing differently around sales methods and how how you sell? Yeah, uh, we should probably separate this. You're you're just going off the bullet points I put out there right now. You're just like hammering me at like you're going to hold me accountable to everything I wrote in that email, aren't you? That's what we're doing here. No, no, great, great points, and you know we've got to <laughs> stick to stick stick to plan, and it's a All big right. thing. But I think yeah, yeah. If, what we want to do question. in this conversation is is to is to flip people's minds so they can just think differently right now. So you can go, what could I do immediately that would make a difference? Because so much of the planning we do is so long-term and I think yeah. getting some short-term perspective. Well, what, what important. it too is like some of this is inherited behavior. So it, like um, when it comes to sales or the sales approach right now, um, I, the, the, what I'm seeing that's working right now is actually a throwback to like six years ago. So you can imagine if you've been in business for six years or less, you've learned a certain behavior and not having recognized there's another way of doing sales or, or doing some outreach and doing an approach. And uh, I well, quite literally, I wrote in my notes, you need to open new doors, literally. And what I mean by that is travel. Travel seems to be working like crazy right now. Um, there was like, for the last three or four years, people didn't come into the office. They weren't showing up at, at the office. If you went to Manhattan, people weren't in Manhattan to go and visit. 
So we got into this other approach of doing all of our cold outreach via LinkedIn, via email, if you're lucky you got anywhere. And like the software has been vetting something for us. And we start these cold leads in a conversational way, but using computers to get us there. But, and I, I honestly, it's probably been, it's easily been six years, if not longer, since mm. I've seen the, the ability to show up and say to a cold outreach, hey, do you want to go to coffee? I, I've never met you before. I don't know. Hey, really quick, would you want to go? I'm actually in Manhattan. And people say, yeah, come on. I think there's a desire to connect, desire to welcome you in. They'll, they will literally open a, a total different door for you and say, yeah, come to the office. I'd love to. I'm the only person here. There's only seven or eight of us in the office. Come in and sit down. Yeah. And that, that Some immediate, office is so empty right now. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this immediate personal connection with a cold. You're getting to know the person for the first time um, face to face. That's so exciting. The difficulty I think is, is people don't know how to do it. They, especially if you've only been in business <laughs> for six years, like what does that meeting agenda look like? Um, I don't know, mm. Matt, with you, you used to run an agency. You did, you probably did a lot of face-to-face -face meetings, especially with uh, when you're doing con the consulting firm. Like that's all kind of face-to-face -face approach back then. Yeah, and I think, you know, face-to-face, -face, it's important to just, like we always talk about having a relationship. Um, but when you meet someone the first time, actually don't just die, don't just open your laptop and start taking them through the show. Get to know them, figure out what they're like. Um, Seth's got their hand up and wants to ask a question. He's uh yeah. he's looking very contemplative. Yeah. What what do you what do you do, Seth, when it comes to meeting complete oh, strangers? I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to chime in there. That's actually how I met Jared, the owner of Deep Sky. I was getting ready to move to Portland and I just reached I just looked up studios in Portland. I was in the tech industry and uh I just started calling him and was like, Hey, you don't know me, I don't know you. I just want to get to know the people in the area. I I'd love to come meet you and share with you some some stuff I'm excited about. And here I am almost 10 years later uh, in yeah. the thick of it with him. So yeah, yeah it make felt like friendships. Um, we'll just say like pre-tech, right? Because there wasn't necessarily the technology to do all the cold outreach up front, or we weren't as familiar with it. In a way, we used to do that. I, I'm not sold I would mail a letter and then wait for a response in a letter. At least I would send faxes, right? No, just kidding. But you know, like there's some. I'm sending a letter. I'm sending a letter to one. I've got a client that we're sending yeah. to. Like I just said, if you want them to read it, it's got to be printed, and it's yeah, got to be in a nice envelope, and yeah. it's got to be addressed to them. So I'm actually doing that with someone. Right. I mean, like back in the day, you throw a VHS tape into a, a padded envelope and send that to somebody waiting for a, a response for that like physical thing. And I'm not saying go all the way back there, but the technology is basically made up for something. And the novelty of the technology allowed us to, to change our behavior. But I think there's like a, a COVID hangover of like, I'm tired of not actually seeing people. So it's such a welcome mm. idea that I, I know people that are going to a city totally cold and saying, I'm going to basically set myself up with six meetings before I leave the city and meeting complete strangers, as well as some They've anchored it with other clients that are there. Um, but yeah, yeah Seth, it's, uh, you're in a way like 10 years ago is today again. Like it's all kind of coming back. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. So it's kind of fun. Uh, we've got a quick I think question, that you might need a question from Andrew. Oh, yeah. Andrew's got a question here, which goes back to the production challenge um, where he said, we've got a long-term client who's done five rounds of production with us each time, a varying number of SKUs. And we've worked hard to show them the increasing efficiency each round but still on the latest round they came back and having five previously approved budgets in hand to look over still came to us expecting double the SKUs for a third of the previous pricing from six months ago. We're just not sure how to overcome that. Oh, that's really um, good. I, I, like, uh, this is like such good industry talk with throwing SKUs and um, yeah. So, okay, let me finish the thought real quick with sales and then I'll answer that question because yep. um, what, what I was going to say is if I was going to invest in this sales approach, what's interesting is, is we might've lost the skill of knowing what to say face-to-face -face or how to ask for a meeting face-to-face. -face. So just be aware of that. It seems very obvious, but there's an awkwardness for you to do the ask. And that might be something that you might need to ask a friend or get some information from. Um, but if you have a salesperson, you might have to encourage them to, to say, it's okay, you can actually go do it. I just know the ones that the people that are doing it, they don't have to be so bold. They're not like the crazy salesperson out there doing it. Um, they're actually very welcoming and very understanding. And there it's a really simple invitation to walk in. 
And then that face-to-face meeting, have some structure to it. You know, like sit down, feel free to get to know each other, have a personal touch, you know, order coffee, learn about each other's background, their history, where they came from. Any history that you can relate to, to somebody is awesome. Where they went to school, where else they've worked, who else you know in common. Even if you don't know that, you could say, how did we meet each other again? And you say, they go like LinkedIn. You're like, oh, that's so crazy. Isn't LinkedIn? And you can relate to that. So find something up front that's very relatable, unrelated to business. Eventually, you're going to have to get to the ask. So something that gets you to the point of, of saying, you might just name drop or project drop something in your conversation. Oh, yeah, really great. When we work with so-and-so at this agency, we had such a wonderful time. Or do you know this person that we've worked with recently? They've done something like you like you, and throw it back to them, but at least kind of name drop. And that begins the business conversation. That you can start having relevant understanding of what you do, who you work with, the type of projects you have. Because your expectation is they've done their homework, but you can't assume that when you're having the face-to-face conversation. And then towards the end, it doesn't have to be a hard win. Don't go for the hard push. Just be very simple, like, it's been really great to meet you. Thanks for taking the last hour. It's so fun to meet people face-to-face. It's been so long since I had a chance to do that. If we're ever given a chance again to connect, I would love to do that. And when they say, yeah, that would great be great. What you mean by that is next week, when I have a chance to connect with you, I'll reach out. But you just leave an invitation open and that's all you need. You don't need to walk away with a project. They might hand you one, but you just want the cold lead, right? This is from cold to warm. So um, be ready for that. Okay, so that's my pointer. So like where I think the, the cold face-to-face win. And the Jedi mind trick I was told by a sales guy once of any face-to-face meeting is see who pays the bill. So when you're leaving, if it's a good bill, whoever's going to pay the bill is the one who wants the other person more. That was something that someone told me. He was a bit of a sociopath, so he may have been tracking this thing more than anyone else. But uh, it is always interesting if you have a meeting with a complete stranger and they go, no, 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 let me get this. You go, yes, you like me. Um, So I guess the third, you know... uh well, I'll, do I, mean, uh, like a, I can ask you Andrew's question if that's um, the right time to kind of jump into that. Yeah, yes, okay. yes. Let's talk okay, about cool. SKUs. So what's interesting, Andrew, is this thought process of when your product, production team is actually working with production team or doing these multiple rounds, one of the techniques a senior producer would do or a seasoned producer would do was actually know when to pull back, to, re, to know when to basically let that client win. So sometimes you're going to win by accepting a lower price or lower priced items. So in an easy way, I would pivot that would be say something like, and I don't know your situation, Andrew, specifically, if you want to wait to the end and get into it, but I'll just give a general understanding that if I was partnering with a, uh, a client and trying to you know, warm up this technique that I'm talking about here, I would get a sense of like, hey, client, I hear what you're saying. There actually is more efficiency in the pipeline nowadays. So we used to charge you 20. Now we would only have to charge you 17. We actually know. So I'm only charging you 17 for that line item. But still it's 25,000, not 20. Do you know what I mean? Like that's the, that's the drop is to come alongside them and recognize with them the efficiencies that you've given them that and you've actually given them the discount that they deserve because of the efficiencies. But then to somewhat give them an understanding of what you're doing differently or why this project goes beyond just that commodity base that they're basing off of. So it's a little bit of a tactic to know when and how to do that dance with them, but to know when to give up actually can help you gain ground in the future or gain ground in this one conversation. So that just, I would think of it like that. That's why I'm saying, I think your production, especially a seasoned producer knows when and how to do that dance. And I have a feeling that's why they're winning more instead of the ones that are guarding the the fences. No, it's just 20. We can't do it for less. We can't do it for less. And just yelling that all the time, like we actually, you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to create animosity between you and, and the future client. Well, we've got eight minutes left on the clock, Tim, and we're going to talk about the third leg of the donkey, which is talent. Um, obviously, we've seen a lot of changes with talent, with, with lockdown and COVID, but how can we help our teams work better to be more effective and perhaps more profitable. What would you do? What, what are we doing there? That's a really good question, but I have to ask a question first. Do donkeys in Australia only have three legs? Because that's, I've never heard of a three legged donkey. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> we, we do. Three legged okay, donkeys, yeah. they, they, it's, it's, it's cruel and brutal, but 
It's just yeah, something I know, we do. I know this is a process of like Australian donkeys. I only have three legs. All right, we'll get back to the question. We okay, don't want so, them moving around too much. So talent engagement, I've actually been talking to this for, for months now. Um, he, here's the pattern that, we've, that we were poor at responding to and therefore got ourselves into to a hole. We're, we've become dependent over decades that when a client awards a project, we actually believe them. So they award a project and we're thinking, great, that means we're going to start soon. So we either retain current resources in the company or we go get new ones anticipating the start date. But recently, or I'll just say all of 2024, if not sooner, the clients have been ghosting us in this weird way. So they would award a project and then there's like a three-week pause. And that three-week or five-week pause, or even it's just one week, we basically burned a bunch of resources waiting for something to start. And we haven't been very good at judging that. We couldn't really measure it because it was an unusual behavior. And we were basically calling it an anomaly. Okay, what happens every once in a while? But almost universally, kid you not, across all countries, across all seg segments, this behavior has become something that's popped up. And I'm going to get to the bottom of it. I am. And when I do, I'm going to do another revolve accelerator because this is one of those big dynamic shifts we have to talk about. So I'm researching it. Just expect me to find the answer pretty soon. But I'll get back to this. So because of this, the people that are winning opposed to people that are suffering with small margins are the ones who've been managing these resources really accurately, meaning that they are not bringing on people until the project actually starts, not the award date. And they're managing these bookings properly. They're, they're communicating really well with the freelancers. Hey, I'd like to put you on hold. And when we get the green lights, I will give you the green light. They're also talking to the clients. Hey, until you give us the green light, we're not going to be ready. So we're not going to hold back resources waiting for at, at, to be at your beckoning call whenever you say yes. It's a really simple uh, communication that you say to the, to the client and saying, if you green light by next Wednesday, this is what we're going to be, we can start with this budget. If it goes beyond that, no problem. We'll still take the win, but we might need to ramp up our team when that time comes. So working with that client to help them understand what the repercussions of their indecision is. And if their, your client's indecision is what you're working through or working against, that we have to now manage our resources to match that. So we've been burning money and we've been feeling smaller margins, but the teams that have actually been managing their clients' bookings really well, or their team's bookings, you can call it utilization, using your, the utilization of your team really well, are the ones that are finding profit areas that we just haven't, we didn't need to before. It, the systematically... We had a way of measuring it and, and it always worked out. Now I, we need to find those new areas um, within, within the resource management. Yeah, and those big businesses are fiendish of utilization. I can certainly say that consultants are. They watch it with a magnifying glass. Yeah, the, the, I've seen, there's a, I have a client specifically whose production team is basically worn out because what they were doing was micromanaging their resources. And what I mean by that is basically overmanaging or trying to find every little nook and cranny that they can move a, a team on or off. And my suggestion for them was, let's not do that anymore. Let's just, if we burn time against a project waiting for the client, let's charge the client for that time. And what the pushback to me was from, from my client was to say, well, then we're gonna run out of money sooner. And I'd say, right. You're going to run out of money sooner, so you're going to have to ask for an overage sooner, or you're going to have to manage expectations or work with your client differently. But for you to be micromanaging, burning yourself out and trying to find every minute that you could put somebody on and off and move people around three or four times a day was really just burning out the team. So I don't mean micromanage yeah, they, that way. Yeah. What I mean by is on and off switches that, that are in sync with the client. When the client is mm -hmm. on hold, we're on hold, the team's on hold. And the, and if the hold was not anticipated, it becomes an overage. Hey, client, I don't mind putting someone on hold for three days. We didn't anticipate that. Just so you know, we're, we might have to look into to an overage if we still go beyond our deadline. And you tell the client up sooner, they recognize it, they agree. And then you've set yourself up for maybe making up for that and getting more revenue instead of uh, trying to find it on, in the small margins. Sounds like a very mature adult conversation to be having. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is where I think <laughs> the more seasoned producers are really winning nowadays. 
It really is making mm. it. Yeah. yeah. How did I do? I could talk about this all day. So if anyone else has another question. You could. Please. I think that there's still two minutes. Does anyone else have a question? Because I think those three things should light some fires and, and definitely get some cogs turning. Um, uh, ben, how's things? how are things going with you? You've been attentive this whole session. I've been watching you paying a lot of attention. Funny because that last one is something we're just literally talking about right now around just like balancing when are we starting and the resourcing because we're entirely freelance based. So I'm listening and trying to just project forward on, uh, you know, the resourcing strategy when it comes to that kind of setup. And I think the language that you're talking about, which we use in project, like in product production, when things are delayed and feedback, we're always saying, okay, we get it, things take longer. But, you know, let's just look at the end goal. Do we need to expand that? Do we want to talk about a change order to add more scope? And that always scares them into, oh, shit, we'll make a decision, which is really useful. Um, or, hey, yeah, no, we can't make a decision. What's the impact? Which is nice as well. Yeah. Um, but when we're working on a resourcing structure that's fluid as it is, because we don't have in-house resources currently, um, I mean, we don't face the problem then of losing money while people are waiting. Um, but we do face the real concern of losing the resource. And that's, so it's like... Yeah rolling that around, I realize, uh, you know, we've worked with Tim for a few weeks now. It's like, it's, it's having the hard conversation with a client as often as possible to make sure you remind them. Just like, you know, if you're a, ho a home contractor and uh, it's like, yeah, I got a crew ready to go next Monday. Are you ready for me to show up? Um, you know, people need to feel a bit of, a lot of pressure to making the decision, knowing that there's a lot of other things being impacted by indecision. So this is very yeah. valuable. If I were, if, I kind of almost want to timestamp this advice too, because this this will not always work and has not always worked. It works right now because freelancers are available. Like the market is not that demanding. So you can manage more and ask for, for more information and more oversight of a freelancer and they'll happily accept the terms that you give them. If it was a competitive freelance marketplace, you could try this all you wanted to the talent's going to walk away and take another paycheck, mm -hmm. right? So it does have kind of a timestamp element to it. The problem is current and this solution I'm pr presenting is off and just current. I'm just showing, telling you what I see people winning at specifically in this moment. When I looked at the, the, the first half year numbers from clients, asked why certain ones are profitable, kind of dove into what I know about them or called them. This was one of the behaviors I saw of like, oh, I get it. You're actually winning on the production side. I look at their roll up. I see higher margins than I see with other other people. And I can see that in the behavior. So, um, you know, that, that's well brought up, especially if you're going to be in that situation, Ben, where like you're using freelancers primarily as a company, you're going to have to understand these behaviors more and more, um, either adopt people into your company or adopt different behaviors based off of the seasons. Yeah, thank you. We're also just expanding our scale of our resource pool as well. Yeah, in time, just right? You have to match that launch. with the revenue opportunities, yeah. All right, Matt, I know you have, um, it is 6.45 a.m. or whatever it is in Australia. <laughs> 7.31. 7.31. The day has begun. You have to get kids uh, cereal and bowls and and off to the oh, no, school cereal, bus. Cereal is out of bowls. We're just going to get out the door. But it is. Uh, this has been an excellent conversation. And I've, I've certainly, there's a lot percolating in mind that it's been excellent to run through with everyone. So uh, thank you all for sharing and, and showing up. Yeah, I love this stuff, clearly. Whenever I can see numbers and share them, I want to give everyone insight, especially if it creates a benefit for behavior. So thank you all for asking the questions. It's great to be part of this. And uh, until next week, we'll see you at the weekly briefing. Thanks, Matt. Truly. See you. Bye, guys.